Welcome to another lesson in Math 513. This one is about the argument principle, which is a consequence of the residue theorem. Here's the theorem. Suppose f is meromorphic in an open set U. So that means f is analytic except for poles. Poles are isolated singularities, and so f is analytic with isolated singularities that are no worse than poles. So you cannot have essential singularities. In the picture below, I drew all the poles in green, so the green axes are poles, and the orange dots are the zeros of f, which you also know are isolated in u. They cannot accumulate anywhere in u. Furthermore, let gamma be a Jordan contour in u that does not pass through any zero or pole of f. That's why I drew the zeros there as well, and not just the poles. So here's gamma, and I had a near miss here with this one zero, so it's not passing through that zero. And such that the inside D of gamma, gamma is a Jordan contour, and so it has a clear inside and outside. It doesn't have any self-intersections. So here's the inside of gamma. And we call that D. So the inside of gamma is contained in U. And there's no missing parts of U inside gamma. So if U has a hole, a hole is allowed right here, for example, but it wouldn't be allowed inside D. Under these assumptions, if you find the integral 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over gamma of f prime divided by f, then the result of that is the number of zeros minus the number of poles of f inside d. So the number of zeros, the orange dots inside d, minus the number of poles, the green crosses inside d, counted with multiplicity, meaning that if you have a pole of order 3, that green cross counts as a 3 and not just as a 1, and similarly for zeros. So this is the argument principle, and we'll get to some really um, wonderful applications of the argument principle uh, in our last class. But for now, we need to just prove the argument principle, and it is proved using the residue theorem. So let's look at the proof of the argument principle. We'll denote by g the component of u that contains the inside of gamma and gamma. So theoretically, u being an open set, it could have several components. So it could be, you know, this and this and this together, and gamma is contained in one of them. We'll just choose the component of u that contains uh, gamma in its inside, and we'll call that component g. We know for sure that f is not identically equal to 0 in d, since gamma didn't pass to any of the zeros of f. So if f was identically equal to 0 in d, then in particular it would be equal to zero on the curve gamma, and so gamma would be passing through lots of zeros of f. Therefore, if you look at f prime over f, the denominator f only has isolated zeros in g, and therefore f prime over f is a meromorphic function. The only singularities appear either at the zeros of f, which make the denominator zero, or the poles of f, which become poles of f prime, which might make the numerator problematic. But f doesn't have any singularities that are worse than poles, and so nothing worse can happen. We want to apply the residue theorem to g. Now remember, the residue theorem says 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over gamma f prime over f is the sum of the residues of f prime over f at the points zk, where the zk's are the distinct poles of f prime over f in d. So the poles, again, can appear at zeros of f or at poles of f. And so we need to figure out what happens at those. What is the residue of f prime over f at a zero of f or at a pole of f? And so our first claim is that if c0 is a zero of order m of f, then the residue of f prime over f is equal to m. And our next claim will be that if c0 is a pole of order m, then the residue of f prime over f is actually negative m. Once we have shown these two things, we're actually done. Because then we'll have that the integral over gamma f prime over f times 1 over 2 pi i, which is the sum of the residues, but each residue at a 0 is the multiplicity of the 0, and then the pole is minus the multiplicity of the pole, and you totally altogether get the number of zeros minus the number of poles where these are counted with multiplicity. So we'll be done once we can establish 1 and 2. And so we'll attack these two things 
one at a time. First, let's look at the case where C0 is a zero of order m of f. What does that mean? That means that f can be written as z minus z0 to the power m times some function g in a little neighborhood around c0. And this function g is analytic and non-zero at c0. So we factored out the maximal amount of zeros that, that f has at c0. So let's look at the derivative of f at c0 then. We'll have f prime of z by the product rule is you know, derivative of the first term, m times z minus c0 to the m minus 1, times the second function, g of c, plus the first function, z minus c0 to the m, times the derivative of the second function, g prime of c. And therefore, we can uh, look at f prime over f and get that f prime over f is, you know, this first expression divided by z minus c0 to the m times g of z. So this is what we need to divide by. And if you divide m times z minus c0 to the m minus 1 g by f, the g's cancel out. And most of the z minus c0's cancel out. There's only one of them left in the denominator, and there's this m left right here. So it's m divided by z minus c0. And for the second term, if you divide z minus c0 to the m times g prime by f, the z minus c0 goes away altogether, and we're left with g prime over g. And this is true, well, not at c0 itself, because at c0, f has a 0, and so we would be dividing by 0. But it's true in the punctured disk, br star of c0. So this, by this notation, I mean the ball of radius r centered at c0, where we're taking the center away. So it's the punctured disk. So we have found that f prime over f has this form, and g is an analytic function. It's analytic in the neighborhood of c0, so g prime over g is analytic, and g of c0 is non-zero, so this is perfectly analytic in this punctured neighborhood b r star of c0. And so the only part of the Laurent series expansion that has negative powers is this first part, and we only have one negative term there, and it's exactly m over z minus c0, which gives you that the residue is precisely equal to m. The other case is very similar. So now let z0 be a pole of order m of f. What does that mean? That means I can write f as an analytic function g divided by z minus c0 to the m and some disk around c0, where this function g in the numerator is analytic and non-zero. So the pole really comes from the z minus c0 to the m. And again, we'll find f prime, this time using the quotient rule. So f prime of z, or actually, I think I used the product rule here again. So I first differentiated the denominator, the derivative of 1 over z minus c0 to the m is minus m times 1 over z minus c0 to the m plus 1. We multiply that by g. And next, we differentiate the numerator, g prime of z, and keep the denominator unchanged. So this is the derivative f prime. And again, we can look at f prime over f. So we divide f prime by f. In the first term, the g cancels out. And all I'm left with is a minus m and one of the z minus c zeros in the denominator. In the second term, z minus c0 to the m cancels out entirely. And all we're left with, again, is g prime over g. And again, this is true in this punctured neighborhood br star of c0. g is analytic and non-zero at c0, so g prime over g is analytic in the neighborhood of c0. And therefore, again, if you look at the residue of f prime over f, it comes entirely from this part right here, and therefore is equal to minus m. And so we have the residue is equal to minus m. So that concludes the proof of the argument principle. The question remains, why is this thing called argument principle? So here's what we proved. We proved 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over gamma of f prime over f is then the number of zeros of f inside gamma minus the number of poles of f inside gamma. But now notice that the integral on the left can be rewritten. Because we have an f prime over f here, we can do a substitution. So we can have zeta is equal to 
f of z. And then, you know, d zeta is equal to f prime of z dz. You make this precise, but basically you get the integral over 1 over zeta d zeta, but instead of integrating over gamma, you're going to have to integrate over f of gamma. And so the integral on the left is the same as 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over f of gamma, 1 over zeta d zeta. And what is that? Well, that's the winding number of the curve f of gamma around the origin. Because here, the integrand is 1 over zeta, which is 1 over zeta minus 0. So that's exactly the form that the integrand has in the winding number formula. So this is how often the curve f of gamma winds around the origin. But how often does the curve wind around the origin? Well, it, it tells that, that tells you the change of the argument of f of gamma around 0. If you walk around f of gamma, how much does the argument change? If you walk around 0, suppose this is 0, and you walk around 0 once with a curve, then the argument has changed from 0 to 2 pi. And so the change of argument would be 2 pi. If you divide that by 2 pi, you know, you, or 2 pi i, so you divide that by 2 pi, you get a 1 here. So it's the winding number. So the number of zeros minus the number of poles is equal to the change of argument of f of gamma around 0. That's why this is called the argument principle. We'll finish with a consequence of the argument principle, and this consequence will allow us to prove the open mapping theorem and some other cool facts during the last class. So here's the theorem. Suppose f is analytic in the disk of radius, uppercase r, and let alpha be equal to f of a, so the value of f at the center of this disk. If f takes the value alpha with multiplicity m at a, so that means that if you look at f of z minus alpha, then that function has a zero at a, and that zero will be of multiplicity m. So it has an m fold zero at a, so you could factor out a z minus a to the m in that form. So if that is the case, then this theorem claims that there exists a positive epsilon that's less than r and a positive delta, such that for zetas that are within delta of a, the equation f of z equals zeta has m distinct solutions in the ball of radius epsilon around a. So I can find exactly m preimages of zeta under f in this disk of radius epsilon. Now, in particular, this means that the image of this epsilon ball here under f must contain the delta ball, because every point in the delta ball has preimages in the epsilon ball. So the entire epsilon ball gets mapped at least onto, but if not, not something bigger than the delta ball. So this theorem is a little bit confusing in its statement. What's really, really important is this consequence. So mostly we'll be using this consequence here, but we'll also use the exact precise statement. So one more time. If f takes the value alpha with multiplicity m at a, so f of z minus alpha has a zero of multiplicity m, then in the little neighborhood around alpha, each point has exactly m preimages from a little neighborhood around a, and they're all distinct. And each point has exactly the same number of preimages, and that number is given by the number m, the multiplicity with which f takes the value alpha at a. So let's see how we can prove this theorem. So first of all, we notice that zeros of analytic functions are isolated. We knew that. Unless the function is identically equal to zero, its zeros are isolated. This is true for any analytic function. And therefore, we can find a positive value of epsilon and we'll choose it so that it's less than r over 2. r was the radius of that initial disk in which f is defined. So that the equation f of z equals alpha has no more solutions in the disk of radius 2 epsilon centered at a. We know at a, f of z equals 
f takes the value alpha. a is mapped to alpha. But since a is mapped to alpha, we can be assured that in a neighborhood of a, if we choose that neighborhood small enough, the value alpha is not taken again. Because we can look at the function f of z minus alpha, it has a 0 at a, zeros are isolated, so we can choose the neighborhood small enough so there are no more zeros in that small neighborhood. So that's how we can find our value of epsilon. We can furthermore assume that epsilon was chosen so that f prime is non-zero in the, in the punctured disk of radius 2 epsilon centered at a. Because if f takes the value alpha, at a with a multiplicity greater than 1, then the, then the derivative of f will be 0 at that point. Since analytic functions have isolated zeros, there's going to be a whole neighborhood in which the derivative is non-zero. But even if f takes the value alpha with multiplicity 1 at a, and the derivative is non-zero at that point, but if it's non-zero by continuity, there's a whole neighborhood in which it is also non-zero. So we can assume that in the punctured neighborhood around a of radius 2 epsilon, the function f prime has no zeros. So now that gamma of t be that boundary of that ball of radius epsilon, so it's a plus epsilon e to the 2 pi i t, and t is between 0 and 1, and beta is the image under f of gamma. So here's a picture of what might be happening. What we know for sure is that alpha the image of f under a, is not on the trace of beta because we chose for epsilon so that f does not take the value alpha in the, in the disk of radius 2 epsilon, even though certainly not on gamma. And that means we can find a little disk around alpha of radius delta that is completely disjoint from the trace of beta. So we can find a little disk here of radius delta such that the ball of radius delta centered at alpha does not intersect the curve beta. So therefore, the ball of radius delta around alpha is contained in one component of the complement of the curve beta. You can see here that the complement of my curve beta could have several components, even though gamma itself was a simple closed curve, or Jordan curve, because f may not be an injective function, the curve f of gamma may have self-intersections and do all kinds of stuff. However, we don't have to worry about that on our disk b delta of alpha, which must be contained in one component because it doesn't intersect the curve beta at all. And so therefore, for any point zeta inside this disk is a little hard to read here. I mean, I'll erase the picture in a second, but I really want to keep it there for one more second. So for any point zeta in this disk of radius delta around alpha, we have that the winding number of beta with respect to alpha is the same as the winding number of beta with respect to zeta, because the entire disk is in the same component of beta. So no matter which point you choose in this disk, they all have the same winding number Beta winds around all these points the same number of times because they're in the same component of the complement of beta. So I'll erase the picture now. So we have n of beta around alpha is the same as n of beta around zeta for any zeta in b delta of alpha. But the definition of this winding number is 1 over 2 pi i dw over w minus zeta. And beta is the curve f composed with gamma. Now we can do a substitution here. Instead of integrating over f composed with gamma, we'll simply integrate over f. I'm sorry, over gamma, and we get 1 over 2 pi i f prime of w over f of w minus zeta. But that we know what that is by the argument principle. We're integrating a derivative over a function. What's the function? What's the derivative? We're really integrating the derivative of f of w minus zeta. So the derivative of that divided by f of w minus zeta. By the argument principle, that gives you the number of zeros of f minus zeta minus the number of poles of f minus zeta counted with multiplicity inside gamma. So the number of zeros of f minus zeta minus the number of poles. But f doesn't have any poles. So f is an analytic function, so this part is actually not here. So all this is counting is the number of zeros of f minus zeta 
inside gamma. So it counts how often f takes the value theta inside gamma. In other words, n of beta alpha equals the number of zeros of f minus zeta inside gamma for every zeta, no matter which zeta I choose in b delta of alpha. So the number of zeros of f minus zeta inside gamma is the same for every zeta. In particular, it's equal to the number of zeros of f minus alpha inside gamma. But the number of zeros of f minus alpha is precisely m, the multiplicity with which f takes the value alpha at a. So that's equal to m. So m is equal to the number of zeros of f minus zeta inside gamma. So the number of times f takes the value zeta inside gamma. So that's m. So f takes the value zeta m times in here. So there must be m points at which f takes the value zeta. So the number of zeros of f minus alpha is equal to the number of zeros of f minus zeta in this ball of radius epsilon. We have that f prime is non-zero in the epsilon of a, and therefore all these zeros are simple. So why is this the case? Well, if f took the value zeta with a multiplicity greater than one at some point z zero, then we could write f of z minus zeta at that point as z minus z zero to some power k bigger than one times g of z. And then the derivative, if we took the derivative of both sides of this equation, we would get k times z minus z zero to the k minus one, since k was bigger than one, that k minus one is still at least one times g plus z minus z zero to the k times g prime. And therefore, we would have that f prime of c zero is equal to zero. So we're just observing here, whenever f takes a value with a multiplicity higher than one at a certain point, then its derivative is actually zero at that point. Since we said the derivative is non-zero, we chose our epsilon so that the derivative is non-zero in b epsilon of a, all the zeros of f minus zeta therefore must be simple. And therefore, f takes the value zeta, this pink value, precisely m distinct times, and they're all simple, in this ball of radius epsilon at a. So that concludes everything I wanted you to know before our last class, in which we'll prove the open mapping theorem and some other cool facts. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving.